Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Amen. All right. So this scene in Matthew chapter 14, we're going to be looking at verses 22 and 23, uh, is again, not only a familiar passage, it's, it's one that you can read of also in the book of Mark and the book of John. However, they only record the, scene, the, the part of the story with Jesus walking on the water. It's only Matthew of all four gospels that uh, also includes Peter walking on the water here. Uh, And of course, anytime we open up the Bible, it's always important to look at the context, uh, which simply just means what are the verses that came before this passage and what are the verses that come after this passage. And that way, we have a full picture of what it is that God wants to say and what the Bible has for us today. So earlier in Matthew chapter 14, before the section we're about ready to look at, Jesus was teaching here on a mountainside. And then it says the people that he was teaching began to get hungry. There were thousands of people there, multitudes, it says. And so he performs this incredible miracle, which I wish we also had time to look at, uh, where he took a a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, and he multiplies them. And it says there that he feeds 5,000 people, probably men plus women and children. So this incredible miracle, miraculous, uh, and then that's where our story picks up here, and that's where we jump in. So again, this story that we're looking at, this scene here from Matthew 14, was written this morning for us, as is all of God's Word, but this particular scene, I believe, is for you. I believe God has a word for you, not because you're going to be out in the middle of a physical storm, not because we're sailors or we're fishermen, but because there are going to be storms of difficult days that all of us are going to face. And because Jesus is the same as he is in the story we're going to read here, he has something to say to you today in the middle of your storm. And our pastor, Ed, always tells us when it comes to the Christian experience that we either seem to be in the midst of a storm right now, and maybe some of you could be like, yeah, that's, that's me. I am in the middle of something very overwhelming right now. Or we're on our way out of the storm, and some of you guys are like, praise the Lord, I made it, God has been faithful, I'm, I'm, I'm getting through this by the grace of God. And then for some of us, this just might be preparation, because some of us are going to enter into a storm at some point in the future. And so for any of us in any of the, the places that we are today, God does have something to say. I am not a fan of storms. I will say that right away. If there's anything I could do to avoid the storm, I would do it. If I could just get around it and bypass it and say, Lord, I'll, I, is there another way I can learn the lesson, please, <laughs> right? But the reality is uh, we all have storms. Every single one of us, we're going to face storms of difficulty. And so again, they're inevitable So Jesus this morning, I believe, would speak to us wherever we are uh, regarding these things. So again, Matthew 14, beginning here in verse 22, starts here by saying, this is again after the feeding of the 5,000, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat. Literally there is the idea of he constrained the disciples. And it says, he uh, says to them, go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So at some point, after this incredible miracle of feeding 5,000 people, Jesus pulls the disciples aside. He says, guys, we're going to cross over the Sea of Galilee here. We're going to head to this area called Gennesaret. And as you notice, after the scene that we're looking at today, there's a divine appointment there for Jesus uh, and the disciples. But Jesus says, hey, this is what we'll do. Guys, you go ahead of me. I'll meet you guys there, and I'll take care of dismissing the crowds here. And again, this is a big deal. The disciples were probably always part of this uh, dispersion of these thousands of people. Now, the Sea of Galilee here that they're about ready to cross uh, was 15 miles long. But right up at the top of the Sea of Galilee, it's seven miles wide. That's the part that they're going to cross, those seven miles And so they're headed 
from where they currently are in this area called Bethsaida to this area called Gennesaret. Uh, across those seven miles, they're moving from the east to the west. And one thing we do know is Peter and this crew here are very familiar with this territory. Uh, they sailed the Sea of Galilee multiple times. They're, they're fishermen. They're, they're familiar with boating. So this is not unusual for them to do this. Again, very familiar ter- uh, terrain. And at this point in the day, the sun is setting. Jesus stays behind. He begins to dismiss the crowds. The disciples here get into the boat without Jesus. They put their sails up, and they head out to the west of the, on the Sea of Galilee to, uh, to the seven miles to get to Gennesaret. Again, uh, something they had done multiple times before. Now, verse 23, it says, After dismissing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Well into the night, he was there alone. We read that a lot about Jesus. He often would go away to pray. A lot of times it would be well into the night. Other places say that he would get, get alone with the Father and pray all night long. Uh, obviously, he must have told this to his disciples later, at least Matthew here, who's writing this down, uh, because at this point, they're on the boat. They weren't there to know what was taking place. Uh, they had already left, and they're in the middle of their journey across the Sea of Galilee. They didn't watch him dispersing, uh, dispersing the crowd there. Uh, they didn't see Jesus getting alone with the Father at that point to pray. Uh, but I always think, man, if Jesus had to get alone to pray, Jesus... <laughs> How much more do I need to get alone with the Father to pray? What a great little lesson there for us. If this was life for Jesus, if this was how he received direction, if this was refreshment for Jesus, then how much do we need to be praying and to get alone with the Father when the horizontal becomes less important and the vertical, our relationship with him, becomes attractive to us? And so here's Jesus on this mountain praying. Here's his disciples on the boat And we're going to take a look at three particular things. If you guys are taking notes here, uh, three things that we're going to take note of here in the story, and then there'll be three takeaways at the very end. And so the first thing we want to take note of here, number one, is the terror of the storm. The terror of the storm. We'll see this in verses 24 through 26. Verse 24 says, Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from the land. So John, in his gospel, giving us the same account here, gives us a little bit more information and tells us that they had already rowed three or four miles. So again, if it's seven miles, they're at about the halfway point, maybe just a little bit further. So they're right pretty much in equal distance between either side of the land there. And it says here that as they were some distance from the land, they were battered by the waves because the wind was against them. Mark tells us in chapter 6 that Jesus could see them from the mountain that he was on while he was praying. And I think most likely he he was able to see them supernaturally. Uh, And he could see them, it says in Mark, toiling. And he could see them rowing because the wind was coming against them. Again, John, in his account in John 6, 17, says this, that the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. And the tense there in the Greek gives us a little bit of a, of a, of a picture because it says there, that verse, John 6, 17, uh, it means the sea arose more and more. The idea is it was getting worse and worse, that this storm that came out of nowhere was a pretty significant life-threatening storm because of the great wind that was blowing against them. So if any of you guys have been to the Sea of Galilee, you can probably picture that in your mind, what it looks like. Some of you guys have been on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Uh, As you know, it is 600 miles below sea level. And what will happen even still to this day is that the cold air will drop from the Mediterranean into something called an inversion layer. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there can be eight to 10 foot waves on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, And that can still happen today. Uh, I was just uh, looking at Instagram earlier, and there's this massive hurricane, evidently, that's coming to uh, Southern California. It doesn't happen much, but we've got a lot of friends out there. And uh, one one guy posted some pictures of these six-foot waves as they're preparing for this hurricane that's on its way. I think it's arriving, I think, today or tomorrow. Um, So imagine eight to ten-foot waves here on the Sea of Galilee. 
As a matter of fact, just last year in Israel, uh, there was a massive storm that they recorded gusts of winds up to 87 miles per hour. That would be considered gale force winds. Uh, it caused so much flooding and so much damage that they estimated uh, it, it was $50 million in damage from just this one storm last year. Uh, in, in the book of Mark, just a few months before the scene that we're looking at here in Matthew, uh, it tells us that there was a fierce windstorm, and the disciples were also in a boat at that time as well. This fierce windstorm. Uh, the NIV translation of Mark 4 tells us it was a furious squall. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of what they're up against here in the midst of this particular storm. So at some point, the sails on their boat have to come down and the oars come out. And so they're battling and they're pushing against the gust of wind, trying to make their way to the other side. Uh, culturally, at the afternoon here would start at three o'clock. So uh, evening starting at three, after they got on the boat and they left the multitudes and left Jesus behind, commentators say that at this point in Matthew 14, they could have been rowing for six hours, if you can imagine that. Some commentators say it was probably even more likely eight or nine hours of rowing in the midst of the storm, just trying to get to the other side. So they're still here in the middle of the sea. They're not getting any closer to the land because of the resistance that they're facing. Mark tells us in his gospel that at this point they are troubled. They're troubled. They're concerned. Uh, the King James Version actually uses the word tortured. Gives us a little bit of a, of a deeper perspective. These, these guys are on the boat and they're experiencing terror. They're afraid. You can imagine after hours and hours of rowing, the blisters at that point on their hands, they are feeling physically exhausted and worn out. Their backs are probably hurting. And I got to give it to them that these guys were persistent. Jesus said, get to the other side. And they were making their way with everything that they had, trying to get to the other side. They could have potentially cut and run and turn back around, which probably would have been easier to get back. But they, they kept persisting, moving forward. They kept working and working, and they kept rowing and rowing, and yet they weren't getting any further to their destination. And, and by the way, they're in this situation because, as we noticed back in verse 22, Jesus made him get them get into the boat there. Literally, he constrained them, it says there. So this was no option. That's the idea. Jesus said, no, you guys must get into the boat and go ahead of me. That was the idea here. So, and now they, here they are without Jesus in the middle of a storm, not even sure if they're going to be able to make it to the other side. So they're in, again, uh, this storm that's not letting up anytime soon, feeling the terror of the storm. Uh, it tells us in the previous storm that they were afraid they were going to drown. They, they woke Jesus up. He was sleeping on the boat, and they said, Jesus, we're going to die. Uh, we get the same idea that that's what they're feeling here, not sure if they're even going to make it out of this particular storm alive. And these disciples, I think, are going to learn a lesson here because they're in a physical storm in this scene, but they're going to go through many storms for the rest of their life, and not all physical. Some of them are going to be storms of difficulty, some of them are going to be storms of persecution all the way up until the day of their martyrdom. All of the disciples, with the exception of John, all gave their lives. They were murdered for the sake of the gospel and preaching the gospel and sharing the message of Jesus. And so they're learning lessons here that I believe God wants for you and I this morning. And he wants us to see some things that he's putting forward here. And as I mentioned before, I would much rather take the online course. If there was a course that said Storms 101, I would pay my money, I would take the course, and wouldn't have to worry about it, right? Like I could just give me all the information and I'm good to go. Uh, but obviously, it's not the way it works because storms are a part of all of our lives. And the point is that we are all going to go through our own storms. So again, the disciples here, just hours before being in the middle of this scene, had just experienced the great mercy of Jesus as he fed 5,000 people plus. Uh, he was concerned. The people were hungry, and Jesus cares 
about all of the details of our lives. And so he asked if there was any food. They brought him some bread and fish, and he multiplied it. And it says that there were even baskets full left afterwards. And so they just saw Jesus and experienced this incredible miracle and saw the mercy of Jesus. But somehow in the midst of the storm here, it seems that they are forgetting the mercy of Jesus for them. So it tells us here in verse 25, Jesus came towards them walking on the sea very early in the morning. I love how just out of nowhere, as if it's just something that happens every day, Jesus just happens to walk on the sea, right? This is an incredible miracle that's happening here. Jesus walking on water. Now, it's probably about the fourth watch of the night here, which would probably be somewhere uh, between two o'clock to four o'clock here in the morning. And verse 26 tells us, when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. And I completely get it (laughs) because I would be too, right? It tells us earlier when they were in the storm that they were troubled. Now they see this figure walking to them and it says they're terrified at this point. And of course, their first response, as it says here in verse 26, is it's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, just imagine the scene. At first, Jesus supernaturally sees them from the mountain while he's praying. And I think it's supernatural because, again, he's at least three and a half miles away from them. It's overcast because of the storm. It's the middle of the night. Who knows how long he was watching them, but Mark tells us he was watching them. I'm sure they didn't know that Jesus was watching them. They probably felt very alone and afraid But meanwhile, three and a half miles behind them, there's their Savior with his eyes on them. No doubt he was praying for them as he was in the middle of his prayer there. And I think for you and I today as well, it's good for us to be aware that Jesus also sees us in the middle of our storms. That whatever you're walking through in this moment, he's aware of it. He hasn't turned his face away from you. He sees you. He loves you. And I believe Scripture tells us as well that he is praying for you. That's an amazing reality to know that if you're in the middle of a difficulty, whatever that difficulty might be, there's various kinds of storms that we can walk through. Physical storms, sickness, financial storms. But there is Jesus in heaven, the right hand of the Father, and he is praying for you. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He is able to save completely those who come to God through him since, I love this, since he always lives to intercede for them, for you. Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is going before the Father on your behalf. What an amazing thought. I mean, it's a privilege to have you guys praying for one another, isn't it? To know you can come into the house of the Lord here and to know that there are people here that love Jesus that will carry your burden with you. But man, To know that Jesus is praying for us is powerful. So good. And then Jesus comes to them. So he's on the mountain praying. I don't know what this was like, but at some point he walks down the mountain. There they are in the middle of the boat, and they're fighting against the wind and pressing against it. And somewhere down on the shore, Jesus takes his first step onto the Sea of Galilee, and he begins to walk. And I can't imagine what that was like. I I often wonder, were there other fishermen, maybe even one guy that was there batching down his boats, and he's there on the shore watching. Perhaps he knows it's Jesus, perhaps he doesn't, but watching this dude get on the water and start walking on the water. You know, I wonder if we'll meet that guy at some point, because I want to find out what it was like for him. But just imagine the scene. Here's Jesus. The wind is strong, so strong at this point that no doubt the sails now on the boat have to go down. We know the oars came out. So here they are now battling the wind to get to the other side. The disciples are, because they're rowing, they would be facing backwards, moving in the direction that they're headed, which would have meant then that they're facing the area that Jesus himself would have been walking, the direction that he was walking towards them. Again, we don't know here if there was lightning, if there was that kind of a storm. Does Peter at some point look in the distance and say, like, I think I see, looks like a guy out there walking. And then there's another flash of lightning and, and a couple of the other disciples go, you know what? I think there is. I think there's somebody out there walking towards us. Mark's gospel actually says something really funny. I don't understand what it means, uh, but it says that Jesus kept walking as though he would have walked right by them. 
So just for free information there. I don't know if Jesus would have just said, hey, see you guys over there, right? Just kept walking. But I love that. Uh, Jesus here is walking to them on the sea. This had never happened before, by the way. In human history, has anyone ever walked on water before? And so as the disciples are seeing this, there was no category to file this in their minds, right? This is, a, this is new. Uh, and again, he must have been close enough to them for them to see him. Maybe they didn't recognize who he was, um, and they clearly didn't because their first response was that it's a ghost. <laughs> it's some kind of apparition. And it says that they cried out in fear. Now, literally in the Greek, it gives us a deeper picture of what's happening there. Literally, it says they began to shriek and they began to scream. So if you can imagine 12 burly dudes on this boat fishermen, right? And here they are shrieking and screaming in the middle of the storm. These are, by the way, the apostles, our heroes of the faith, right? Screaming on this boat here. These are the guys that Jesus is going to hand the keys of the kingdom to. These are the guys that are going to start the early church. But in this scene here, they are screaming and shrieking in the middle of the storm in terror. But the reality is they'd never been here before. They'd never been here. This, this was not, they didn't know the next chapter. They didn't know what was happening. And again, as we mentioned before, they were previously in another storm, which was probably preparation for this storm. But back in Matthew chapter 8, in that scene, the difference is Jesus was in the boat with them. And it says that as they were on the boat, Jesus lays down and falls asleep. And the storm comes quickly again, as it does in this scene. And it says there that the disciples wake him up and they say, Jesus, we are going to die. And so Jesus stands up, puts his hand out. It's, he says, peace, be still. And it says there that he rebuked the storm and the storm ceased immediately. And then Jesus turns around to the disciples and it says he rebukes them. And he says, you guys, you have such little faith. Why are you doubting? I'm, he I'm here with you. But this time in Matthew 14 here, they're without Jesus. And they're alone here. And then, of course, here comes Jesus walking across the water towards them. One Greek scholar says the way that it reads here when it says that they saw him walking upon the water is that they saw his sandals on the surface of the water. Like they actually saw his feet on top of the water. That's the idea here. That's the picture. So he's got to be close enough here. Again, Matthew says that their first thought, their first response is it's a ghost. And that might sound kind of like a funny thing. Like, do these guys believe in ghosts? But they, again, the majority of them were Jewish. Matthew here is writing to a Jewish audience. And there was a lot of superstition, Jewish superstition. So it could have been very likely that they, they thought something along the lines of, this is an old fisherman who drowned in the sea, and now he's coming to talk to us, right? Something's happening here that is so unusual. Plus, you know, they've been rowing for hours. They're exhausted. Who knows what their, their mental state was in that moment. But their first thought was to think that it was a ghost, but understand this in this picture. Jesus is coming to them. As they are being terrorized by the waves, it says he saw them, that his eyes were upon them, that his concern is for them, that when he was on, on the mountain praying, no doubt it was his prayers that were holding them up. And I want to make note of that because it's important for us to know that whatever is terrorizing you today, that he sees you right now, here. However you've been trying to maneuver through your storm that you're walking through, the toiling and the rowing, and you're feeling worn out, and you're exhausted, and you're not sure if you're going to be able to make it further, and you're trying to navigate whatever difficulty it is that you're up against I just want you to know today that he is coming to you, that in the dark of your storm, his eyes are upon you. He's promised to never leave you, and he's promised he will never forsake you. Now, some of you here might be in the throes of the storm right now and feeling like he has left me. I don't sense his presence. I don't understand why I'm in the middle of this right now. But I can tell you that he has not forsaken you. He, he, he hasn't left you. Whether your storm is a storm of a broken family or a broken relationship or a broken heart or illness or loss, 
Whatever your storm is, no doubt it hurts and it cuts deep. But Jesus would never give himself. He would never leave heaven and come to earth to die on a cross for you, to bring you into this relationship with him, to have you find yourself in the middle of the storm just to abandon you. That's the, Jesus would never do that. That's never been his heart. That's not who he is. As a matter of fact, he said the opposite. He says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Nothing is going to separate my love, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And Jesus wants us to understand today that he sees, that he sees you. He understands and he comes to us. And I believe even through this study, this is a way that Jesus wants you to know I'm coming for you. It's going to be okay. You're not going to drown. So again, number one, there is the terror of the storm. But number two, there is now the test of the storm. The test of the storm. Verses 27 through 31. Here they are. They're crying out. They think it's a ghost. They begin to shriek. They begin to scream. And I love verse 27. It starts by saying immediately. I love that word because when I'm crying out to God in fear, I like the word immediately, right? Immediately, Jesus speaks to them. And he says something so powerful, and it is a word for us today, no doubt. He says, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Have courage. Jesus says, it is I. Literally there, he says, I am. It's the same thing that God said through the burning bush to Moses. It's the same way God identified himself to Abraham. I am. Jesus says, have courage. I am. Don't be afraid. Again, in the Greek there, it's, it's, it's a tense called the present imperative. Literally what he's saying there is, you must stop being afraid. You must stop being afraid. Now, that's hard to hear, I think, at least, in the middle of the storm. Like, I, I understand, I, I read this, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me and says, Josh, you must stop being afraid. And I know it's true, and I'll even say, Lord, I, I get it. Like, I know I don't need to be afraid, but God, I am afraid. And I'm still struggling, because I don't know what's coming, and this is scary. A storm, Lord, I, this is overwhelming. And And many of us could probably say we feel that way, especially if we're in the middle of the storm. I've been walking through storms for months now in my own life. One of the reasons I felt even led to bring this passage to us this morning is because as a pastor, I'm having so many conversations with you guys, and I'm just hearing about difficulty after difficulty, storm after storm. And it can feel overwhelming, can't it? It really can. And my heart breaks to hear some of the things that you guys are going through. And we do get afraid. But notice what he says here. Before he says, don't be afraid, he says, it is I. And that makes all the difference. That always comes before don't be afraid. His presence. He's saying, it's I. I am. I am here with you. You don't need to be afraid. I'm with you. Like the psalm says in Psalm 23, I will fear no evil because you are with me. So they hear his voice here above the wind, above the raging sea. If you can imagine that, you can't hear anything typically in an environment like this because the wind is screaming, the waves are crashing. You got these 12 dudes screaming and shrieking, uh, and yet his voice carries, I believe, supernaturally over all of the chaos to say, Have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And I believe, too, that his voice carries over whatever it is that you're walking through. If you feel like you're in the midst of the crashing waves and the wind is all around you and you can barely think straight, that his voice carries over all of that to say to you, have courage. You don't need to be afraid. Stop being afraid because I am here. I am with you. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the rock that's immovable, unshakable, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's the rock that we build our lives on, like a house, right? And when the waves crash, it doesn't come down because it's built on a rock. The psalmist says, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock 
that is higher than I. He says that rock is a refuge and I run to it and I find safety there and I'm hidden there within the cleft of that rock. And Jesus is saying to you today, that's who I am. The storm may feel scary, but it's no match for me, Jesus would say. And because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, if you are in a tough situation this morning, know this, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you through his word, saying, because Jesus never changes, that yes, the storms are terrifying, and yes, the, the things seem threatening to us, but he would say again, I am God Almighty. Take courage. You don't need to be afraid. I am with you. It is I, <laughs> the familiar voice of Jesus. We all know the voice of Jesus. Anyone here that has walked with the Lord for any amount of time, we can all say, I know when it's Jesus speaking to me. I don't audibly hear Jesus, but there's a, a language of the heart, and he speaks to me there. And there's his word, and he speaks to me there. And it's a familiar, gentle, tender, comforting voice. Sometimes it's a strong word, right? But when we need it, 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 is, it is life, always is life to us. And Jesus is speaking. Notice here, we don't need to stop being afraid because the storm goes away but we can stop being afraid because Jesus is in the midst of it with you. Again, we live very much in this physical existence, our senses, what we see, what we feel, what we experience. So that's why it can be so difficult. Uh, but there is coming a day on the other side of eternity where the storms will stop. There will be no more storms. Every tear will be wiped away. No more death no more sorrow, no more addiction, no more pornography, no more divorce, no more abuse. It will be wonderful. It will be wonderful. Glory awaits us on the other side. Healing awaits us on the other side. Restored relationships await us on the other side. But this ain't heaven, right? We're still on earth. We're still walking through. The journey is going to be difficult Difficult days are going to come, but take note that the storms that come are tests. They're tests. This storm was a test for them. Your storm is a test for you. And the test is, are we going to trust more what surrounds us, or will we trust the one who stands with us in the middle of it? So verse 28 Peter, of course, of all of the disciples, decides to speak up here. <laughs> in the middle of the storm, in the boat, Peter shouts out. They think it's a ghost. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, and, and some scholars say that the class condition there is since it's you, um, but either way, it's still Peter trying to determine Jesus's identity here. First, they thought it was a ghost. Now, Peter's, it's becoming clear. So he says, Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. That, by the way, is such a Peter thing to say. Like, if you study the life of Peter, he's always saying things, putting his foot in his mouth. Uh, I don't know what the other guys were thinking when they heard Peter say this, right? Like, Peter, keep your mouth shut, please. Just let Jesus get into the boat. That worked really well for us last time, right? But Peter decides, for whatever reason, to say, command me to come out to you on the water. What a, what a funny thing. What a remarkable thing, right, for Peter to say. Uh, Jesus, you're walking on the water. So maybe I could walk on the water too. And if you commanded me, I could come out to you. So verse 29, Jesus speaking here to Peter says, he, he says, said, come. <laughs> so at that moment, if I was Peter, I'd be thinking, I really wish you wouldn't have said that, right? Like that was just supposed to sound impressive. I didn't actually think you would tell me, Lord, to come out, right? I wish he would have said, no, 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 no. You stay in the boat, Peter. I'll come to you. But Jesus says, okay, you want this, let's go, come. Verse, the rest of verse 29 says, climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. So again, the storm is still raging. Let's remember that. This is in the middle of chaos. Supernaturally, Jesus speaks to them. Peter responds. I'm not sure exactly what was going on in Peter's mind at that, at that time, but, but Peter, it says he gets out of the boat. So I can imagine, this is what I would do at least. I would put my foot over the boat and just test the waters. Like, oh wow, I can act like my foot's not going down. And I get out the other side and I would hold on to the boat just to make sure I'm stabilized. But can you imagine Peter lets go and he's on the water? And all the disciples are like, 
Peter. <laughs> Dang, that's impressive, right? And here he is. He takes one step after another, and it says he walks on the water and came towards Jesus. And I don't know what's more amazing in this scene, honestly. It's the fact that you have the Lord of creation himself, Jesus, the Lord of the wind, the Lord of the storm walking on water. That's remarkable. Or is it more remarkable that you have a sinner like you and me walking on the water? (laughs) They're both pretty impressive. They're both remarkable. Jesus says, Peter, come. And, And I just want to take note here that Jesus often will call us to a place like this where he will say, come, in the midst of what might seem illogical, in the midst of what might seem like it doesn't make sense. It's, it's not something that I had planned uh, for. Uh, it doesn't even look like it's the right thing to do, but Jesus bids come. And you know, there's moments in our lives, aren't there, where we sense the voice of Jesus calling us into something out of our comfort zone to accomplish whatever it is that he wants to accomplish. But when we're unwilling to take a step of faith out of the boat into the water, then we will miss the promise that he has for us in the middle of that situation. And we're going to miss whatever miracle it is that he wants to do through you in your life. And even more important than that, we're going to miss some of the depth of his love for us. So just a word from maybe any of you that have sensed in your heart the bidding of the Lord into something, whatever that is, moving you towards something, calling you, saying, come. Don't be unwilling because you're afraid, but take the step of faith as Peter climbs out of the boat and walks on water here, defying gravity, right? He, this is a miracle, what's taking place. So as Peter is walking, it says, towards Jesus, verse 30 tells us, when he saw the strength of the wind, and, and again, it was noisy too, the crashing waves, the wind, perhaps lightning, it was just chaotic all around. Peter there looks around, sees the strength of the wind. It says he was afraid, and I would be too, right? And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. There's an important lesson here because it tells us beginning, as he was beginning to sink. And I would just say that is the most important time. So beginning, it says there. Imagine that. Some people wait as they're drowning, just right up until their nose is over the water. They're like, okay, Lord, I give. That's the moment I cry out to you. It says here, though, the moment Peter began to sink. Think of someone like Jonah, right? He was thrown into a different kind of a storm. He was swallowed by a whale. And it tells us there that he was in the whale for three days and three nights. And and then it's then that he decides to cry out. He's already in the whale at that point, right? Some people like Jonah and like me, we can be stubborn sometimes. Um, But this is important. When you are beginning to sink, cry out. When you're beginning to sense yourself going down, cry out to him. He's there. Peter cries out here three simple words, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Uh, Again, sometimes there's no time for a big eloquent prayer. Peter here wasn't thinking through, how can I be the most eloquent and the most theological here as I'm about ready to drown? No, sometimes it's just a a quick, desperate prayer. Uh, and, And again, Scripture tells us that he doesn't hear us for our many words. Uh, That's not the point. Jesus isn't impressed uh, by our prayers when we say a lot. He's looking at our hearts. And so three simple words like this from a sincere heart can mean so much more than a hundred eloquent words from somebody that's just going through the motion. So just a word of encouragement for some of you that are here that are afraid to pray in front of other people or think that your prayers aren't as spiritual or don't sound as good as other people. Uh, sometimes our prayers just need to be like this, Lord, save me. You can't get much more simple than that, right? And I have no doubt Peter was so sincere in this prayer here. And then again, verse 31, another word immediately there. I love that. As Peter is crying out, Lord, save me, immediately, immediately, right there, Jesus responds to his prayer. When you cry out in prayer, I just want you to know immediately Jesus will respond to your prayer as well. 
He never turns a deaf ear to any of us. As a matter of fact, he inclines his ear to us, the psalmist says. He bends down and he listens. There's actually in the Hebrew, it's a beautiful picture where it says that he stoops down and he looks at you face to face. Is this beautiful idea. When you pray, when you cry out to him. And then it says here that Jesus reached out his hand. So Peter obviously is close enough now for Jesus to reach out his hand, to take hold of him, and to lift him up out of the water. Now sadly for someone like me, there's more times in my life where I will cry out to him when I'm sinking, but I'm not often crying out to him when I'm walking. (laughs) Those, Those prayers become more desperate when difficulty comes into my life. Uh, And I want my prayers to be the same. I want, in the good seasons of life, I want to be desperate. And I want to seek the Lord in this kind of a way. But what's interesting is, as Peter is closer to Jesus and going down into the water, he's more closer then, as Jesus is rescuing him, than he is as he's walking. It's in his drowning and in his desperation, he's closer to Jesus than it was when he got out of the boat and walked towards Jesus. And it says here, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, And he takes hold of Peter's life. And Jesus is no respecter of persons. So he responds again to you and to I as your, as his daughter, as his son. He'll respond to us just as much as he responds here to Peter. So know that if you feel that the Lord doesn't hear your prayers in this season, oh, he hears you. He hears you. If you feel like the Lord has forgotten you, no, he's watching you. He sees you. If you feel like the Lord is distant, no, he's coming to you. If you feel like the Lord has forsaken you, no, he is exactly where he needs to be. And he's not distant from you at all. He's close. And I love this. It says that Jesus caught hold of him. What a picture. And maybe that just needs to be your prayer. Lord, I am drowning right now. I don't know what's coming but this is difficult. But Lord, I see you catching hold of Peter here. Lord, would you catch hold of me? If it's true that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord, I need you to catch hold of me. And as Jesus does this, and no doubt he brings Peter up, back up on the water, he looks at Peter, and there's a little bit of a rebuke. I believe it's a gentle rebuke. But he looks at Peter and he says here, Peter, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? And I wonder if at this point, the other guys in the boat are just like, I am really glad I didn't get out of the boat. Peter, that was all you, right? But when Jesus here says, why did you doubt? The the word for doubt there in the Greek is epistos. And it means to take two stands. It means to stand for one thing and to stand for another thing. So Jesus is saying here to Peter, you have little faith. Why did you say, let me come out to you on the water? And then I say, come. And then you become more afraid of the storm than you do my beckoning you to come. And so this was a test of faith for Peter. And Peter, by the way, we got to give him credit. He did have a measure of faith, right? He, he had enough faith to get out of the boat and to begin to walk, (laughs) which requires faith. But somewhere along the way, his doubt began to overwhelm him. So we see here again, the terror of the storm. We see the test of the storm. And then our third point here is that we see the truth of the storm. The truth of the storm, verses 32 and 33. It says here in verse 32, when they got into the boat... And again, what were the guys thinking at this point? Uh, You know, it tells us in John, they helped them get into the boat. So they're pulling them into the boat. And there they are standing in the boat together. Jesus back in the boat with them. Peter back in the boat with them again. When Peter and Jesus got back into the boat, it says the wind ceased. And the storm was over. And verse 33, those in the boat worshipped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. Now, John, again, in his account, it says in John 6, 21, then they were willing to take him into the boat. And it says there, immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. So again, they're in the midst of the sea a second before. Jesus gets into the boat with them and the bow crunches up against the shore. 
and they're there. They're at their destination. They literally traveled three and a half miles in a moment. It says here, immediately, John tells us, immediately they were, they were at the shore where they were headed. When Jesus gets into the boat with them, then they are immediately where they want to be. And it says here that the wind ceased, so the storm is over. As soon as Jesus steps into the boat with them, the wind stops, the crunch And there they are on the land. And it says here, no doubt, they looked at each other. The storm is over. Peter's alive. Jesus is there with them. They're at the destination there. And I just got to believe they're looking at each other with amazement. And then they look back to Jesus. And they say, truly, truly, you are the son of God. And for any of us here that have walked through storms, because we are a family of believers, many of us have been walking with Jesus for a long time, many of us could testify here, I have been through storms. As a matter of fact, there are some of you here that I know uh, have walked through some of the deepest storms, uh, and you are some of the most joyful, peace-filled Christians that I've ever met. But you are able to say, Man, it was scary, but God has been nothing but faithful to me. And God has been nothing but good. And you're able on the other side to look back and see that. Me, on the other hand, (laughs) I, I will often go through a storm and struggle my way through it. And then after I come through the other side, I'll say, Lord, of course you were there with me the whole time. Why did I even doubt? Of course, Jesus, you were true to your word. Why didn't I just lay hold of you? Truly, you are the Son of God. And it says that they worshiped. And so if you're in the middle of a storm now, or your storm has just recently ended, or you're about ready to enter into the storm, and this is just a word of preparation for you, we get to declare in this place, no matter what's surrounding us right now, that Jesus is the Son of God in your life, that Jesus walks upon the waters of your difficulty, that Jesus speaks a greater word over your struggle, over the wind, over the waves. He sees you as you're toiling. He sees you as you're struggling, and he's never left you, and he will not leave you. So three very quick takeaways as we close here, just to kind of help wrap this up and to help us sort of have three things that we can hold on to from all that we've looked at this morning. Number one, our first takeaway, as we mentioned before, Jesus never loses sight of those he loves. Jesus never loses sight of those he loves. And that may be a word for you today. See, the first time, the first storm that the disciples were in, it says they turned to Jesus in Mark 4.38 and they say, teacher, don't you care if we drowned? And that was when Jesus, by the way, was in the boat with them. He was there with them. And here in this scene, I got to imagine they're saying, where is Jesus when we need him the most? Why is he not here with us? It must have felt like Jesus had abandoned them. It must have felt like Jesus had forgotten them. But the reality is Jesus was on a mountain three and a half miles away on his way to them. He was praying for them and he saw their struggle because Jesus never loses sight of those he loves and he hasn't lost sight of you either. He sees you. Whether or not you sense him right now in this moment, whether or not you feel the power of God in your circumstances or not, he is there and he will catch hold of you and it will be okay. Number two, second takeaway, the wrong perception of the Savior is greater danger than the storm. The wrong perception of the Savior is greater danger than the storm. In other words, if we think Jesus is just here to give us what we want, a life of comfort, a life of ease, a life inside the boat, there are plenty of churches that will teach that. It's called the prosperity gospel. But that's not what Jesus teaches. Because if we think that that's what he has for us, a life of comfort and ease and health and wealth, then we will end up frustrated the moment a storm comes into our life. And we will end up despairing and we will end up questioning the ways of God. But it's true that, again, in all of our lives, storms come and some of them are storms of correction. Not all of them, but some of them God allows into our lives, just as he did with Jonah. Jonah needed a storm of correction. God loved Jonah and God loved the people that Jonah was being sent to. 
But that storm in Jonah's life was a storm of correction, but there's also storms of instruction. Instruction. And that's what we're seeing here in Matthew 14. They are in the middle of his will when they go out to the sea. They are in the middle of his will when the storm hits them. And we have to remember that when we're in a difficult situation, we are still in the middle of his good will. My first thought is to say, okay, Lord, what is it that I did this time that's bringing this on? Like, right, what did I do to deserve this? But I often don't think, and God's working with me on this. Okay, Lord, this is difficult. What is it that you're wanting to show me in this? What is it, how are you wanting to deepen me in this? How are you wanting me to trust you more in this? How are you conforming me into the image of your son, making me more like Jesus in the midst of this? So if you're here today and you're frustrated at God or perhaps even angry at God because you're in a difficult situation, and if you have had a wrong perspective of him, I just want you to know this today. The whole reason you're in a storm is because he wants to rescue you from the storm and show you something in the middle of that. In other words, he hasn't saved you and then brought you this far in your walk with Jesus and then leaving you in the middle of the storm to frustrate you. That's not his heart. He doesn't want that. And again, he hasn't brought you this far to abandon you. That certainly is not who he is or what he wants. No, you don't have to understand all the ways of God in this moment, and that's okay. We don't all understand the ways of God. But I believe that he would say to you, do you trust me? Not how you feel right now, not whether you can sense my presence or not right now, but do you trust my character? Do you believe I will come through? And do you trust that I will not let you go? So again, the wrong perception of the Savior is greater than the storm itself. And then our third and final takeaway as we wrap up here, Peace is found not in the absence of storms, but in the presence of Jesus. Peace is found not in the absence of storms, but in the presence of Jesus. You see, Jesus didn't invite Peter into the water once he calmed the water. That's the way I would like to be invited into the water, but that's not what Jesus did. He invited Peter into the water in the middle of the storm. The calming of the storm didn't happen until later. And in the rebuke of Peter there, it was because Peter took his eyes off of Jesus. He started focusing on the storm around him rather than Jesus who was right in front of him. Because peace is found in the presence of Jesus. It's not found in the absence of storm. It's the opposite, again, of how so many of us operate. We think of peace like, I'm going to retire, I'm going to play golf, and everything's going to be great for the rest of my life. We think of peace as the good life, or the easy life, or smooth sailing from this time out, right? That to us is often how we think of peace, that if we trust him, again, he'll give us exactly what we want. But Jesus never promised us that. And I think it's important for us to hear that. As a matter of fact, he, he, he promises the opposite. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. He says, you will have trials. He says, you will have storms that will come upon your life, but you can have peace, Jesus would say, if you keep your eyes on me. No matter what's happening around you, walls are crashing relationships are burning, finances are crumbling, the world is getting more and more insane, but keep your eyes on me and you will find peace. The psalmist says it this way, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. I like what the 20th century British pastor Martin Lloyd-Jones says, this is great, he says, if we only spent more of our time in looking at Christ, we should soon forget ourselves. So when our eyes are in Jesus, they're not on the storm, and that's how we are at peace in the storm. So as the worship team comes out and as we close here, I just want to uh, say, you know, normally a, a, a message like this um, can often be wrapped up in, I mean, I could ask you guys to stand, and if you're in the middle of a storm, 
And I would suspect that probably most of us could stand. Um, and then we, we would have people lay hands and, and pray for you. And that's appropriate. And that's wonderful. And that's the body of Christ uh, bearing one another's burdens. But, but I just felt the Lord say today, no, this is, this is your storm. Right now, this is between you and Jesus. And what did the disciples do when Jesus got in the boat? They worshiped. And I just want to take this moment here to close. And, and as the worship team comes out in this final song of worship, And this is our way of saying, no matter what storm I'm in, no matter what it is that I'm walking through, Jesus, truly you are the son of God. And I'm going to proclaim it and I'm going to shout it above my storm, above my difficulty, above my pain, above my confusion, above my doubt. God, that you are here. You are in this place. You are coming towards me. You're nothing but good. You will be faithful. There's a room full of people here that will say, God will be faithful to you because he's been faithful to me. He will see you through because he's seen me through. And so we're just going to lift our voices and lift our hands and worship the Son of God in this place. And lastly, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, the very Jesus that we're reading about here, I just want to say this, whatever your difficulty is, he loves you. He loves you. And he offers his hand to you today as you're drowning in your sin and your sorrow. And like Peter, you have to willingly receive him. You can't receive him again because a Christian is trying to shove him down your throat. Mom or dad dragging you to church. You can't receive him because people will give you pat answers for pat problems but you can receive him because today, suddenly you see him walking on the waters toward you. And he offers himself to you as your savior. The Bible says that we're separated from him because of sin. So we're drowning. That's our destination. We're we're, we're gonna sink. But Jesus came from heaven to earth, lived a perfect life, died a death, that you and I deserved, paid a price that you and I could never pay so that he could declare over your life, it is finished. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter how awful your life has been, only Jesus has the ability to say to you, I can forgive all of it and take it away as if you never did it. And I'll prove it, and Jesus did prove it because he died to pay that price. And three days later, he rose up again from the dead, proving he has the power not only over death, but he has the power over your sin to wipe it away, to forgive you. No person has ever forgiven us the way that Jesus forgives us. Pastor Ed has a verse on the pulpit here that he says he reads every time he comes up here to preach. It's from Romans 10 verses 9 through 10. And this is the invitation for those of you here that don't know Jesus. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it would be our honor as pastors, as a church team, as a prayer team, as a church family here, that if you don't know Jesus, that you would come up at the end of the service, grab one of us, say, I am the one that has been sinking and I'm reaching out my hand, knowing that Jesus has already reached out his hand to me and he will catch hold of you. And we'd love to pray with you. And that goes for any of us here, any of us in a storm. If you're just needing somebody to be the hands and the feet of Jesus today and and walk through that storm with you, to pray with you, just to tell you it's going to be okay. We are here. That's what this gathering is all about. We need one another. We can't do this alone, especially when we're in the storms that some of you guys are walking through. But our response now, uh, before we go to one another in these things, is to go to Jesus. Truly, you are the Son of God. So let's stand and let's worship and let's sing louder than the storm in our lives and praise him for all that he's done. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877 877- 
304-704-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.